Good afternoon to all. I'm Dr. Padma Gunratna, President, Sri Lanka Medical Association. Let me um, welcome all of you to the uh, pre-Congress, uh, the uh, Stroke Unit Care pre-Congress uh, workshop uh, that we organize uh, on stroke unit care for clinicians uh, as a pre-Congress activity of the 134th anniversary International Medical Congress of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Uh, you know that uh, stroke is uh, very much uh, um, sort of a very much uh, neglected topic in the general practice that has been the way with it over the last several decades. And uh, uh, I mean, say over the last uh, two decades or so that there were so many important introductions for improvement of the stroke care. Uh, one of the most important that improved stroke care to some extent is the stroke unit care that was introduced for the scientific community about uh, three decades ago. Stroke unit care was introduced about three days ago, yet here in Sri Lanka, we have the only about uh, 50 to 60 stroke beds for stroke patients when uh, it is about 10 per thousand prevalence in the community. Uh, the reason why we do not get stroke units established is uh, one of the reasons is that the lack of experience of the clinicians who treat the stroke patients. So that's why we felt that it is important as, I mean, for, as the uh, president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, I felt that it's important for uh, us to give training to all junior doctors, as well as the registrars in medicine, registrars in geriatrics, registrars in rehabilitation, as well as the senior registrars, uh, including senior registrars in neurology, to be familiar with the uh, standard stroke unit care, so that on a date that you, when you become a, a physician, then you would be uh, uh, capable in commencing your own stroke unit uh, at the place wherever that you are working. So based on that, we have uh, um, developed a program. Uh, this is a WHO uh, sponsored program where there will be five Zoom lectures followed by a one uh, day, one uh, uh, a half of a day workshop on rehabilitation. So as the uh, inaugural day uh, of the uh, stroke unit care for clinicians, um, uh, I welcome all of you for this pre-Congress activity. Our very first speaker today is uh, Dr. Seneca Bandusena, consultant neurologist at the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. And he would be talking to you on burden of stroke in Sri Lanka and the essentials of setting for stroke Okay. Uh, so uh, over to you, Seneca. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much, Madam, for that kind introduction. So as Madam mentioned, these are uh, a pre-Congress program uh, uh, titled Stroke Clinic Care for Clinicians. And uh, the topic that I have been asked to talk to you all is to give you some idea about the burden of stroke in Sri Lanka and the essentials of setting for stroke care. So in the next uh, 40 minutes or so, what I will try to uh, share with you is uh, where we are in stroke care as a country, what our strengths are and where our weaknesses are and how we should uh, progress in time to come. Sri Lanka, as we all know, is an island nation in the Indian Ocean with a land area of about 65,610 kilometers and uh, with a population of 21.8 million. It is categorized as a middle income country with an estimated uh, per capita uh, income of 3,682 USD, that is in 2019. And uh, as a country, we have spent 3.9% of our GDP for healthcare. And when we look at the health parameters in general, we find that our health parameters are pretty good. So our average life expectancy for a female is 78 years, and for a male, it's 72. Likewise, we have also have a low infant and maternal mortality rate. And this is mainly because of our good public health system that is in, in place. 
So just to show you how our life expectancy has uh, evolved over the years, this is from 1920 to 2013. And you can see in 1920s, it would have been, it's less than 40, but now it has slowly increased and it's where it is now. That is both for males and as well as females, it has improved tremendously. It's always good to compare with countries in the region to get, get us some idea. And when you look at the other countries in the SARC, uh, other SARC countries, you find that Sri Lankan tracing is the one on top, the one that, is, that I'm pointing to, the purple one. And you can see we, we stand out uh, in a considerable way compared to the other countries. So uh, there's uh, India, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Pakistan. So ours is far better compared to those countries in the region. And even when you compare with life expectancy of uh, European countries, this is of course a 2015 data. You see that in Europe, the, the Western European countries have life expectancy over 80, but most of Russia and as well as uh, Central and Eastern European countries have life expectancy, probably some of them actually lower than ours. So we are in that setting, quite, uh, we have achieved quite a lot. When you look at the infant mortality, once again, you can see the Sri Lankan tracing is right at the bottom here. So we have very low infant mortality and uh, Maldives also the one in purple here is the Maldivian line. It has also come down to in a similar manner and it's touching ours now. But when you compare the other sub countries, we are doing pretty well. How about the health expenditure? So this shows uh, again the sub countries and uh, shows the percentage of the GDP spent on health. Now, Sri Lankan uh, tracing is the one shown in orange here. So we don't spend much actually on health. You see that. It's somewhere around, it's less than 4% and it's about 3.6 here, this is after 2015 and presently it's about 3. It has gone up a bit, but still it is nowhere compared to some of the other countries. For example, uh, countries like uh, Afghanistan, Maldives, uh, and even Nepal spend far more as a percentage of the GDP. And uh, when you look at the per capita income, the GDP per capita income, we find that once again, Sri Lanka is here, the one in orange. We are here and uh, Maldives being a small country with uh, tourism doing so well, they are right at the top, but we are ahead of the rest of the group. So all in all, when we look at all these things, we find that our general health parameters are pretty good in the region. And uh, also we seem to spend less compared to other countries. It's probably the efficiencies of the system and a good public health system that is in existence which has helped us to achieve these uh, uh, basic uh, health parameters. When it comes to stroke, uh, stroke, according, this is actually according to annual health statistics for 2019, is considered the leading cause of adult disability. And when it comes to causes of hospital death, it, it's ranked number seven. This is the list. On top, we have ischemic heart disease, then infections, neoplasms, and then it's ranked as the seventh highest, leads the seventh highest, the seventh in the list. So it's an important disease from a neurological aspect as well as from a general medical aspect. How about data? So in Sri Lanka, we have very little data, but we have two good population based prevalence studies. So that is, one conducted by Professor Udaya Ranavak in 2007, and another by Professor Tashi Chang in 2015. Both these studies interestingly showed a similar figure. These two studies are actually confined to the Western province, so we have data only uh, in relation to Western province, and that is we have about 10 per thousand population. That is a stroke prevalence. However, we still do not have any population-based prevalence studies outside Western province. And also we don't have any incidence data at the moment. Another major factor when it comes to stroke care is that we have a evolving population demography. And it is uh, estimated that over the last several decades that the elderly population has more or less doubled. So 
from 1981 to 2019, that is in a time period of 38 years. Here you can see the percentage of the population in different age groups. So 1981 is depicted in blue and 2019 is depicted in orange. So here is the over 60 population. And as you can see in 1981, the over 60 population accounted for 6.6% of the population. Whereas in, in 2019, it has risen up to 12.3. It is a significant rise. And uh, correspondingly, there has been a decrease in the under 15 age group. This is mainly due to two reasons. One is, you, as you can see here, you can see the crude birth rate and the crude death rate. So the death rate has come down, but the crude the birth rate has come down as a, at, at a much uh, rapid pace. So due to this, there are, and also the increased life expectancy is leading to this major demographic change that we are witnessing in our country. So we have one of the fastest aging populations, I think in the region and probably in the world. So these are the population pyramids just to uh, get a better idea. Now this uh, population pyramid is what our population consists of in 1981. And here you can see it's a bottom heavy kind of uh, the, the base is broader. But as in 2012, you find that it's getting narrower and the top is becoming a bit heavier. And this is the projected population pyramid for 2041. And as you can see, the younger age groups shown here is going to be even narrower and the old age groups are going to get broader and broader. So the trend is that the elderly percentage in our population is going to increase further in the coming years. Why is it important? Stroke, as we know, is a disease with a higher incidence in older people. And when the older population increases as a percentage, we will find that there are more and more stroke patients, uh, thus leading to greater demand for stroke services. When it comes to stroke care, it's a continuum, we find that there are four main aspects. So one is acute management, and then there's a phase where we manage complications, then rehabilitation, and we also do secondary prevention. It's not really in sequence. There is a great deal of overlap when you do it, but these are the four main areas that we uh, have to deal with when it comes to stroke care. So what is the present status of stroke care in our country? Sri Lanka has a state-funded free and universal healthcare system, which consists of uh, Western and indigenous medical systems. And in addition to the free health services, we all know that there is also a private healthcare system here. And when it comes to stroke patients, most uh, patients, uh, when it comes to acute care, they get admitted to government hospitals, but follow-up could take place either in the state or in the private sector. One important aspect that we have to consider is the bed capacity. So when you look at the total number of beds available in the state health sector with regard in, uh, in the Western medicine section, we find that we have over 86,589 8, 86, hospital beds distributed in 643 hospitals. This is the data from 2019. And uh, this is a table which shows how the hospital beds have increased from 2013 to 2019. And you can see that uh, here from 78,000, it has gone up to 86,000 within a six year period. So I think the trend is upwards. So there is there are more and more hospital beds that have been added. In addition to hospital beds in the state sector for Western medicine, there's also private sector uh, beds. There are about 4,000, there's 4,686 beds in the private sector. And then uh, when you take the indigenous medical sector, that is the, all these Ayurvedic hospitals, you get a, just a little bit over 4,000 beds. So that is the total bed strength in the country. But however, when you look at uh, stroke and in particular neurology beds, we find that it's only a very small number. So in, when you add up all the beds in the 36 neurology units, in Sri Lanka, we have 36 neurology units in the country, the total general neurology bits is 382. And if you look at the dedicated stroke bits in neurology units, it is 74. 
So when you compare to the total number of beds, you find that this is a very small percentage of beds. So from a priority point of view, I think we are not allocating adequate number of beds for stroke. So the 74 stroke beds that we have, these are dedicated beds, are distributed in nine hospitals. Uh, this is from an audit that we did among the neurologists last year. So the National Hospital has 10 beds, then Colombo North Teaching Hospital has six, Srija, then Apura 10, General Hospital, Kalutra six, and then uh, Kurunagala has a large, unit, relatively large unit with 16 beds. So th these are the, the beds that are available for stroke. But in addition to these beds, we know that the rehabilitation hospital, there are seven uh, large rehabilitation hospitals overlooked by the rheumatologists who do provide uh, rehabilitation facilities uh, for many patients, including stroke patients, especially those who are stable and who require long-term rehabilitation. So these are the seven hospitals. So there's one at Ragama, there's another one at Digana, then Jayantipura in Polonnaruwa, and then there's one in Kandagul in Badulla, then one in Gaul and Ampara and Jaffna. And interestingly, there were of the 36 uh, neurology units in the country, 16 neurology units did not have a single bed. So when it comes to human resource side, we uh, have 45 neurologists in active service, which comes to one neurologist per 480,000 population. Coming to stroke care over the years, I think we have made the major strides in many areas. The first uh, main development for stroke care in the country was the establishment of the first stroke unit, uh, which was at the Institute of Neurology National Hospital done during the time of Dr. Jagat J. Sekara. And this, is a unit, uh, this unit has grown in stature over the years and it's still functioning as the role model for training in stroke rehabilitation and also for multidisciplinary team can stroke for the rest of the country. And then uh, another major development was the establishment of the National Stroke Association of Sri Lanka. That was in 2001 and which has contributed in a major way by improving uh, public awareness on stroke risk factors and care and also uh, they have conducted many programs, educational programs, and also they uh, do a lot of advocacy when it comes to stroke. Another major factor that uh, has contributed to improving stroke care is the establishment of the Association of Sri Lanka Neurology, that is the professional body which represents all the neurologists, and that uh, was in 2007. It was established in 2007, and uh, it has been a driving force for coordinated improvement of neurology services in the country and also has helped expansion of stroke services throughout the country. Next, we look at the acute care of stroke. And I think uh, when you look at uh, care in general, I think this was a turning point when it comes to stroke. In 1996, uh, the, the NINS trial showing that RTPA is effective for thrombolysis and that it, it improves outcomes. And uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, the first patient uh, was thrombolyzed in 2008 at the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. And it was uh, mainly Dr. Padma, Madam Padma Gunaratna's initiative that uh, was able to achieve this. And then since then, we see that the thrombolysis uh, uh, facilities have expanded uh, to many other centers. And right now we have 22 hospitals in the state sector. And there's at least one hospital in each of the nine provinces. You can see the distribution in this uh, map here and uh, we are happy to state that wherever there is a neurologist and if there's a CT scanner in each of those hospitals there is thrombolysis so which is a, a great achievement so 2008 uh, now we are in 2021 that is 13 years so our thrombolysis uh, penetration is pretty good and patients uh, are seeking thrombolysis as well to some extent and also we are very pleased that the government of Sri Lanka has shown great commitment as Sri Lanka is one of the very few countries where RTP is offered free of charge in the state sector for patients requiring thrombolysis. I think probably the only country in the South region. When you look at thrombectomy, thrombectomy is another treatment option. Uh, this is large artery occlusions. The first thrombectomy in the country was performed in 2013 in a private hospital, the Acid Central Hospital. And the first thrombectomy at in the state sector was once again at the National Hospital. It was again Madam's main initiative and Madam together with uh, uh, 
Dr. Prasad Disiba, who was the interventional radiologist uh, at National Hospital, performed the first successful thrombectomy in the country. Uh, in addition to that, we know when it comes to stroke, there are many other uh, additional investigations that we need to perform, especially uh, in addition to CT scanning, then uh, carotid Doppler, echocardiography, and heart studies and all that. And when you look at the whole country, we find that these facilities are now available in many hospitals in, uh, in the country. And uh, definitely at least there are one or two hospitals in each of the provinces which provide these. And also when we look at uh, primary and secondary prevention of stroke, which are very important factors, uh, the facilities for monitoring risk factors as well as medication to treat uh, the risk factors, hypertension, uh, dyslipidemia and diabetes is available free of charge in the state sector. So when we uh, look at all these things, I think we can be happy to some extent. Then there is also this, that is the, the ambulance service that was introduced some time ago, the suicide ambulance service. Uh, this, uh, uh, the service was commenced in 2016 in Western and Southern provinces. And then um, now we have uh, 297 ambulances. The, the network has expanded and it covers the whole country. And we are very grateful to the government of India for providing the initial funding and also the technical assistance uh, in establishing this uh, rapid transport, free ambulance transport system in our country. So all these uh, advances have taken place and I think uh, in acute stroke as well as in prevention, but there are several areas that are still lagging. So the areas that I feel are lagging, one is stroke rehabilitation, the other is uh, community support services for patients and carers, and the third is thrombectomy. So with regard to stroke rehabilitation, following a stroke, a significant proportion of patients with stroke are left with disability require rehabilitation. And in an ideal setting, it should be provided in a well-equipped stroke unit with a multidisciplinary team led by a specialist trained in stroke rehabilitation. However, there are only few such stroke units in Sri Lanka and those two also have limited bed capacity. And while neurologists lead stroke care throughout the country, most stroke patients are still admitted to general medical units and are attended to by general physicians. And uh, this is mainly due to lack of neurology and stroke beds as I shown you earlier. And uh, we know that when it comes to uh, stroke care in medical units, we know medical units are really busy with uh, so many admissions and things like that. With the heavy demand, patients are not kept for a reasonable amount of time. The required time on uh, attention for rehab is difficult to begin. And uh, therefore patients are discharged prematurely and most of them seek uh, treatment in uh, Ayurvedic uh, centers as well as some just going home, not getting the required rehabilitation. So we get some idea about the present status from data from this clinical registry. Again, uh, uh, it was a project initiated by Madam and Dr. Jeevagan some, uh, some time ago. Here we looked at data from this registry uh, for a period of six months in 2016, uh, looking at five major hospitals. So the, the hospitals that we took into consideration were National Hospital, in teaching Hospital Candy, Columbus South Teaching Hospital, Jaffna and Karapitiya. And this was the duration, average duration of hospital stay for a stroke patient. So when you look at it, it looks uh, very, uh, it's unbelievable. Like uh, patients are kept on average for 3.5 days at Columbus South Teaching Hospital. This was the hospital that I was working at that time. Candy had 3.7 and then Karapitiya 3.6 and Jaffna 4.5. And when it came to National Hospital, if you exclude the stroke unit, the average just 7.2. And then National Hospital overall lost 10, but stroke unit at patients for an average for about 21 days. So you can see if a patient gets admitted with a stroke, the vast majority are discharged pretty fast from the hospitals. So again, if you look at the average duration of hospital stay for all hospitals, it comes to five days. And when you look at the the duration of hospital stay, uh, you find that it is interesting to know that 17% of stroke patients were actually discharged within 24 hours. And then, uh, not sure how it could happen, but that, that was what 
what the data showed, then uh, the majority of the patients were there for two to seven days, 68%, and then only very few patients uh, were there for longer than two weeks. Whereas when it came to a stroke unit, the average stay was 21 days. So this could uh, be due to several reasons. One is the case mix, maybe the national stroke unit, uh, the NHSS stroke unit had uh, patients who had uh, severe or more uh, higher NHS score and all that. But in addition to that, I think it's the availability of beds for rehabilitation and the commitment to, for rehabilitation that would have determined that those patients were kept for longer. So when, it, uh, when you look at the percentage of admissions uh, to national hospital who are actually catered to in the stroke unit was 15% of the total admissions. So how can we improve? So we clearly see that there is a deficiency here. We, we are not providing, at least when it looks at, uh, we don't have much data regard to the input, but this uh, statistic alone shows that we are not providing a good rehabilitation service uh, at hospitals. So we can uh, look at uh, strategies to improve stroke remedy in two levels. One is macro level and another as a macro, micro level strategy. So what are these macro level strategies? Macro level strategies would involve like prioritizing rehabilitation as an important healthcare goal. And uh, that is where the health ministry and the policymakers and administrators consider rehabilitation as an important healthcare goal, and then they uh, allocate sufficient funds and resources for towards that. And they, it also would involve developing infrastructure, setting up new units, and to improve rehabilitation bed capacity, providing adequate facilities, uh, including equipment for rehabilitation and also training therapists, and developing effective stroke care pathways. So these are macro level strategies but these uh, strategies will require funding, much funding, and also input from uh, health administrators, administrators and policymakers, and often would take time for implementation. So in the meantime, there are several things we as physicians, we could do. These are micro level strategies, is to reorganize the existing facilities to achieve rehabilitation goals. So very often in neurology world, sometimes uh, it's just a matter of allocating a few beds uh, for stroke. Likewise, in a general medical ward, rather than uh, having a uh, stroke patient scattered in the ward, you can have a demarcated area within the ward allocated for rehabilitation of stroke patients. Another would be maybe starting an MDT meeting, a multidisciplinary team care meeting uh, as a first step. And then also introducing scales like Bathurst Index for assessment and monitoring. These aspects will be dealt with more in detail in the subsequent lectures as part of this uh, pre-Congress workshop. And these measures, the micro-level measures would not require much funding and can be done by any neurologist or physician who has the commitment to improve rehabilitation. In addition, it's important to uh, improve the patient and the doctor perception regarding rehabilitation. Sometimes we may have facilities, but if the patients do not have faith or do not, maybe they're not aware. Sometimes the physician, the, the primary care physicians who look after these patients also may not be aware about the importance of rehabilitation or may not know where the rehabilitation facilities are available. So that's something that we had to rectify. Another thing that we need to do is to streamline the referral and transfer system from units which lack necessary facilities to, to units which have facilities. For example, a patient might get admitted to a local hospital where they do not have any uh, stroke rehabilitation facilities or beds, but there may be another hospital in the vicinity which might be having. So it's important for them to get in touch with the one which has and see whether the patient can be transferred for rehabilitation. And also it is important to pay attention to the quality of the services. When we are having a rehabilitation and it's sometimes uh, we, might, we may just have beds, but it's not just having a patient in a bed in a rehabilitation unit. One has to give quality care. And even in the units that we have, we find that the, it's difficult when uh, there are not enough uh, therapists. Uh, sometimes uh, they, uh, a patient who's kept in a rehabilitation unit even might get only about 15 to 20 minutes of physiotherapy for the day, which is not adequate. So I think we have to ensure that 
quality is not compromised in these units. So whether it be macro or micro level strategies, I think it's important that we adapt data-driven or evidence-based strategies. And also we have to always be mindful of the cost involved. Because whatever we do, whether it's a drug therapy or rehabilitation, there's a cost and the cost uh, can be broken down into capital expenditure and recurrent costs. And we have to be cost conscious, especially in a country like ours where there's uh, limited resources and financial constraints. Another area I think we have to pay attention is uh, discharge planning. And uh, that is very important when it comes to a patient who's, uh, uh, who's been in ward and now we are thinking about sending the patient home for a smooth transition, we have to plan it properly. And ideally all uh, the my care team has, all the members of the care team has to give the input and it's a, it has to done, be done in a proper way. And we have to also engage the carer as well as the patient. And uh, these are standard practice adopted in most Western countries, but in Sri Lanka, still it's at its infancy, I would say. And um, another important thing that is lacking in Sri Lanka is home assessments prior to sending patients home. In certain countries, they have uh, uh, occupational therapists who actually visit the patient's home to see how safe it is and they recommend various things, changes that uh, home modification and all that. And uh, that is done prior to discharge. So uh, to my knowledge, this is not happening in Sri Lanka. Maybe another area we can think about improving in time to come. Audits are very important, whether it be rehabilitation or any other unit and to make sure that proper standards are maintained and also to make sure that we use the facilities optimally. And uh, sometimes uh, something that gets in the way is motivation because sometimes uh, even in stroke units, we find that patients after a certain period, they lose interest in the rehabilitation. Likewise, sometimes the stroke team also can lose interest uh, in what they're doing. So it's always important uh, to keep everyone motivated at the, on task at hand. Uh, to achieve what we are planning to do. So this can be done by conducting regular meetings with uh, feedback and also encouragement given to the staff. The next, uh, the second area that, uh, that is still lacking in Sri Lanka is the community support services. And we know that despite best efforts in rehabilitation, there are patients who are left with significant disability and, uh, and who are dependent. And uh, in these situations, the burden often falls on the extended family. And uh, we know that there is a rapidly changing uh, family settings in Sri Lanka. Also many families actually, there, are, there aren't any children to look after. And even if children are there, they're overseas. So uh, there are patients, uh, we find that they don't have uh, an extended family to look after or care support. And uh, that brings us to, in. Uh, to hostels, nursing homes, and palliative care centers. And in Sri Lanka, there are only a handful of these uh, institutes, and this is another service which we will have to think about, especially with a rapidly aging population as we have in the country. And uh, even at the National Hospital, we find that uh, sometimes our patients have to be kept for a very long period because we have no place to discharge them. And I think that's a common finding for other hospitals as well where discharge can be delayed unnecessarily where, because of uh, lack of these intermediate care centers. We also have very little respite care. Respite care is uh, institutes where a patient uh, uh, can be kept for a day or two to give some relief to the carer because sometimes uh, the carer might get burnt out if not. So respite care centers are there in most Western countries and. Uh, I think maybe something that we might also have to think about in time to come. However, there are a few things uh, that have happened in Sri Lanka. One is the involvement of the Department of Social Services. And uh, there are some concessions given to patients with stroke with disability. And through the divisional secretaries, uh, there is a, a provision for housing grants for patients uh, with stroke. There's also some financial assistance the stroke patients can obtain for home modifications, such as disability access. 
uh, if someone uh, needs a toilet with a commode, there's again financial assistance available. And if they do not have electricity or pipe bound water, they can get relief there as well. In addition, uh, they could also get financial grants for obtaining medicine not, not, which are not available in the state sector and also to purchase assistive devices such as wheelchairs and crutches. And uh, there is also provision for vocational training. This is especially important for young people who suffer from strokes because uh, as part of the rehabilitation, we hope one day that they can return back to their normal self and also to uh, be able to at least uh, seek some kind of self-employment. So the social service department does support uh, vocation. They have vocational training programs as well as uh, financial assistance for self-employment. These are already next and there's going to be a talk on this uh, in the workshop that you might be attending. Finally, thrombectomy facilities, uh, uh, of course, we, as I mentioned earlier, it's very limited in Sri Lanka. At the moment, only two hospitals offer, that is the National Hospital Sri Lanka and Asiri Central Hospital, which is a private hospital. There are three new developments uh, which is most, which are going to change the landscape of stroke rehabilitation in the country in the near future, I would think. And the first is the entry of specialists in rehabilitation medicine. So already we have seen uh, uh, physicians in critical care and emergency medicine integrated into the systems and they are doing a wonderful job. Now in a few years time, we will have uh, specialists in rehabilitation medicine uh, this has been a long felt need in the country and it was in 2017 that the PGM offered rehabilitation medicine as a post-MD subspecialty. And I was told that there are seven postgraduates in training and the first batch is expected to commence work in 2023. So definitely the entry of specialists uh, committed for rehabilitation is going to have a huge impact on rehabilitation and they will be the driving force in the near future alongside the neurologists. And the, rehab, and the rheumatology doctors are already providing rehabilitation for patients. The next uh, new development that is happening is the establishment of a national stroke center. Uh, this is again uh, uh, an initiative uh, uh, driven by madam actually during when she was at the national hospital she was the lead neurologist. She started this and it's, uh, uh, it's still ongoing. So there, there is a, a, a a national stroke center which has been built at the Kalambu East Hospital in Mulleriava. And this will uh, increase the bed capacity for rehabilitation, especially uh, in the Western uh, province, where we will have a comprehensive stroke center with the input from multidisciplinary care team with sufficient number of beds. And hopefully this will be commissioned in, in a few years time. The third, uh, is what we hope will happen is that we will we hope that there will be a stroke clinic in each of the provinces. Uh, Ministry of Health in Sri Lanka in 2011 made a policy decision to establish a stroke clinic in each province, and uh, it is anticipated that this would become a reality in the near future because I think it's not only the Western province; there are many patients with stroke in other provinces as well. So to have an equitable uh, service. In the periphery, it is very important that stroke units are developed in all the other provinces as well. So looking at stroke rehabilitation, it is an area with much scope for further improvement and improving capacity and with better coordination within and between sectors and commitment are key aspects required to achieve the final objective, which is to offer an optimal, comfortable setting for stroke patients to facilitate the best possible recovery with dignity. So I'll come to the end of my presentation. So when it comes to stroke care, I think it's very important, first of all, to be committed and uh, to be focused on what we are doing. And then we know it's not an easy task, it's an uphill task. There'll be many obstacles along the way when it comes to improving rehabilitation, but with commitment, I'm sure we can. And as a team, it's always a team that will be able to work, especially in rehabilitation. And, um, and hopefully we will get to the top and achieve our objective in stroke rehabilitation. So with that, um, thank you for your patient listening and I'm concluding my talk. Thank you Definitely. very much.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Seneca, uh, uh, to, I mean, for talking on the burden of stroke and the essentials of uh, stroke care, stroke unit care. Uh, I think that's an important topic that uh, uh, to start a stroke unit, I mean, workshop on stroke unit care uh, as some sort of an initial introduction. Uh, so uh, I, I do not know whether there are any questions that the trainees would like to inquire. Maybe that you could post them on chat box if you have any questions. Yeah, um, uh, in the absence of any questions, uh, let me thank you again, Seneca, and uh, tomorrow with the other talk. Tomorrow. Thank you, madam. Yeah, thank let, you, uh, let me uh, uh, remind trainee, uh, the doctors uh, who have joined, uh, there are four more lectures to go, and the second lecture would be tomorrow again at the same time. Uh, so please join and tell others also who missed today to join the program, uh, this uh, talk presentation, if they have joined for the rest, we could uh, uh, upload, we could upload this presentation so that they, they'll be able to catch up with the uh, workshop. So uh, we would be informing them as well. Join with us uh, for the Stroke Unit Care for Clinicians workshop tomorrow at the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Seneca, again. Uh, for that excellent presentation and uh, stay safe. Thank you.